the battle Illuminati Says the Charlie of the Ducks Is it Disney mind control? Is this MK Ultra Deluxe? I go Disney Come to shop on a star I go Disney To no one to chat far I go Disney Pinio Land, Pinocchio I go Disney As a bomb so low Pinocchio seeks fun on Pleasure Island But traffickers need just for the mines Captain Hook the Lost Boy in Neverland Saving kids from Peter Pan's designs Nemo feels to survive the Barracuda and that nobody means no one Snow White never took another breath The Prince, the Angel of Death has come to Disney We go from real to real I go Disney Bohemian Grove and no more feel I go Disney Ask about to learn that day Go Disney, we teach a call to everybody Go Disney, go wish upon a star Go Disney, you know I'm too shall far Go Disney, the new brand Pinocchio Hello, welcome to the Akot Disney Podcast. It's where we bounce a red rubber ball on the heads of every Disney movie and take them out for recess. That's where you put a red rubber ball on the back of their head. <laughs> Two red rubber balls in the back of the head. That'll that'll give you a hell of a headache. Uh now I'm just imagining like a JFK assassination, but like recess version where he just gets pegged in the back of the head. That could happen here. Hey, what if the, in the movie, today's movie, Recess School's Out, they replace the King of Recess right at the middle or, or Reed Crown, right? That could have happened. They could have had like a, a ritual yeah, a assassination. Ritual, three ritual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and then they can have the killing of the king. And now we get the new guy who had a new letter. I don't remember what it was, but it was because the first guy was K. It was Kevin or something. And the new guy was like a different letter, which I forgot. That did happen. They did replace the king at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, as as for me, I'd have an M on my crown because uh, I'm Matt. Uh, what are you, you want to put PA on your crown? Yeah, I mean, are, are we talking Burger King crown or are we talking like a real crown? Burger King crown, of course. That couldn't have been anything more than a Burger King, King crown in the uh, movie, right? <laughs> I miss them. I miss the Burger King crowns. I just, I think um, they have them um, near you. Uh, I think the City Walk, um, Orlando, they have the the Burger Creation Studio. I, I believe you can get Burger King crowns there, as I saw people having lunch there just a few months ago, all wearing Burger King crowns. Wait, what is it, a Burger Creation Studio? It's basically just a Burger King that has it's some dumb concept. It's just a way to charge concept. 15 bucks for a Burger King burger. Correct. But they will give you the crown, so... That, that's a plus up. <laughs> you know, there, there is a whole, not to get too much of a tangent right off the bat, there's like a whole drama going on right now with one of the businesses that's in the downtown Disney. It's called this high-end cookie company called Gideon's. And I guess they sell like $12 cookies or Biblical something. Cookies. It's, one, yeah, it's one of those places that, you know, if you've got $20 and you just want to burn it as fast as possible, you can just go get a cookie. See, I... I I mentioned, I think I recently went to Disney Sea and the food there's that none of it was like unreasonably priced. I did buy a $15 martini, uh, Manhattan, excuse me. No, actually, you know what? Uh, with the exchange rate, it's a $10 Manhattan, but you know, it's 1,500 yen. And, but then you're sitting in like this really nice wood paneled room. It's, you know, it's, it's cool. So that's on the, the Teddy Roosevelt lounge. If anyone's in Disney Sea and, and you don't have kids with you in the middle of the afternoon, pop in there and have a drink. That's, that's my advice. <laughs> I, I heard someone make this claim this week, and I wasn't sure. It didn't sound accurate, but I guess you might be 
uh, a little bit of an insight that in Japan, when a man and a woman both order the same meal and pay the same price, that the woman will get served a smaller portion. That sometimes happens. Um, I've never done that, so I haven't seen that in real action. I feel like we get served the same portions. You know, it's like uh, I went out with um, my wife and, and uh, Luke, who I often podcast, and his his lady. And um, Luke and I, have cr- of course, got the big piles of meat, uh, mine a small pile of meat, and he had, like, the massive, insane pile of meat. Both of the ladies got the, you know, like, the little pasta dish or whatever. So uh, we were getting completely different stuff. So it's hard to say. But uh, I, I feel like what you're saying has probably happened. Like, that is true in some cases. Uh, lunch menus will sometimes have ladies set, which maybe is, like, slightly smaller. I don't know. Would you say lunch menus have a ladies section? Ladies set. It'll be like, you know, regular set, children's oh, meal. Like, a, like, like, a, set. like the man's meal, the woman's meal, and the kid's meal. Yeah. But sometimes <laughs> you want to order the ladies set. Even when you're a dude, you're like, actually, that's what I want, you know? So you're just like, whatever. I'm a dumb foreigner. I can't read. Maybe they <laughs> think I can't read the katakana. So, you know, I'll just get Is that. it a fo- if, if you were Japanese, would it be a faux pas to order the females? set i don't know they they love you know i mean boys love comics are very popular in japan manga so they, they don't care that's the thing um it, the, the women's rights are in the best in japan but they they don't seem to have it up their rear about gender too much it's it's yeah. kind of weird like like in culture terms they don't in legal terms they have big problems let's put it that way <laughs> culturally Gender's not so bad, but yeah, as far as the law goes in Japan, it, it could be nasty. Pay rates and stuff are still wildly divergent. Now, what about recess? What's the recess policy in Japan? Oh, they definitely have it. Um, my lunch break is usually around 2, 2.30, so I often end up walking near a a um, elementary school. They, they haven't given me a, a stay 50 meters away yet. Um <laughs> But yeah, it's like sometimes it's at like different times of day. Sometimes I'm walking by and it's like no nothing's happening. Sometimes everyone's running around screaming. So uh, they have that. They have sports day. So I, I'm sure they make little kingdoms out. They have a giant schoolyard. So um, one thing in this movie, right from the beginning, I'm like, there's like 300 kids having recess, and then next to a school that's maybe going to uh, successfully house 50 kids. I'm like, oh, is that is that actually a weird statement on the American school system that it's overcrowded, you know? Like, realistically, that school would have, like, eight trailers behind it, you know? <laughs> you, and also, I remember uh, growing up, once I got into, uh, well, a bigger city, not a big city, but the, the lunches and the recess were usually st- staggered. So there would be, like, lunch a b and c and recess a b and c and you might not have lunch with all your friends depending on which one you got assigned to for that exact reason that the cafeteria was only big enough to fit so many kids yeah um one one problem with well just from my personal experience is that um from grade four on i went to like the smart kids school and i feel like we didn't actually have a recess uh partly because they're just what how the school was made you had to go like I mean, we didn't have a playground or anything, so I don't remember what we did. So first to third grade, yeah, we had straight up recess. um, And I don't remember crap, to be honest, except climbing a few things. And um, the the one Puerto Rican kid, every time he won a game, would just start screaming, we beat, we beat for like 20 minutes after. So (laughs) I always remember, I mean... So I I am pro recess for the record. If we're gonna, I think everybody like, is. That's kind of the, the jokey can see of this movie. It's like, why would James <laughs> Woods' character like be that anti? Uh, what was his name? Not not no Finster's the the lunch lady. Oh, you're, um, you're putting me on the spot now. I, I don't even know if I wrote. Uh, oh, I could. I, you know, I could say um, click on this this wiki page that would help me out. Um, <laughs> da, da, da. Yeah. So so spoiler alert. The whole premise of this movie, oh, Doctor Philium Benedict. There we go. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Philium, Philium Benedict, and the the general premise is that James Wood, Doctor Philium Benedict, uh, has invented some sort of weather manipulation device that's going to change the orbit of the moon, and in doing so, he's going to make sure that recess doesn't exist because he's going to get rid of, or no, he's going to get rid of summer. That's what he's going to do. He's going to get rid of summer. And summer vacation, 
by proxy because summer vacation is the ultimate recess from school. It's like the macro recess. Uh, and he wants to take away recess on like every level. So this is his way of doing it's kind of, it's a weird convoluted aspect that since the movie is based on a TV show called recess, that the ultimate arch villain would be trying to cancel recess on some global scale. But there you go. That's, that's the general premise. I love how it's like using an elephant gun for that problem too, because that causes so many. Like the world's food supply is now screwed. You know, <laughs> there's so many. You know, you've just killed fifty percent of the existing species in the world um, in one one blow. So I, I do. I, I thought that was funny. I mean, that's kind of baked in that this plan is actually like going to be like basically apocalyptic too. <laughs> well, and and he seems to be like a pacifist super villain because he tells them early on like don't kill anyone just knock them out like he doesn't like violence uh although there's definitely some close calls where people could have died right right there are ninjas suddenly. and ninja stars yeah <laughs> um I, yeah i think i mentioned before when we when this first came up like i didn't know what this was at all so um i you sort had of had a, the tv show i never even heard of the tv show so I, I, was like, I remember growing up with this one. It, I was on the tail end of it, so uh, I wasn't necessarily the target audience for this anymore. I think I was probably 16-ish. Uh, but I do remember seeing it every once in a while and thinking that it wasn't for me. Uh, it wasn't horrible, though. It was a serviceable cartoon. See, that, that was like me and Doug, right? I was already like 14, 15 when Doug came out. And um, just just to, to be the edgelord today, and then... Keep in mind here, when we did Doug, I couldn't find the actual movie. I watched some Disney episodes on YouTube where they like showed it on a skew TV. So it wasn't like a great watching experience. For Recess, I had the absolute reverse where to get the movie, I had to download everything Recess ever, which I will not be watching. Um, I, I'll be deleting that. So that's another caveat. I will be deleting. I'm not going to sit here and start watching Recess. But I did have a better time watching this because I was sitting here watching Blu-ray quality, la, 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 you know, all that sort of thing. Um, that's a hard one for me. But like, I haven't I would... seen the Nickelodeon Doug show, throwing that out there. have not properly watched that. But just <laughs> from the, my little skims here, I did have a more pleasurable time here. Um, I think it helps that the kids are a little younger for me that I guess it gives it that South Park vibe. Um, I like for me, I, I like, you know, weird social systems and city planning and, you know, staring at maps. And this had a little more of that it had kind of a Mission Impossible vibe to it, which I like. I mean, I got. Uh, obviously, I do some Mission Impossible here and there as the box of the entire TV shows here. So that was appealing to me. Now, if I did sit down, watch all of Nickelodeon's Doug and then actually watch like a series of recess, eh, maybe I'd like Doug better. So I don't know. I'm just talking about the the little flitterings of experience I've had in the past couple months. But um, wh where did you land? I, I'm sure you didn't like this better, but I am curious how, how this rated for you. Oh, it, it wasn't bad. I mean, uh, it was the nice length. It was like an hour and 10 minutes or so, hour and 15 minutes. So that's kind of the sweet spot still. Uh, and it, it had like a decent uh inside jokes for adults and for kids it wasn't like completely juvenile it's also it kind of sits in this weird field of like it doesn't feel like an actual disney movie so i would put it in the same bucket as you mentioned the doug movie maybe even like the goofy movie even though goofy is disney it still had like this standalone vibe like it it wasn't meant to be a theatrical epic disney animated you know uh release it was kind of a TV show formatted as a movie, and it had the vibe. Yeah, I will say, along, along with Doug, and I might even leave the Goofy movie out of this, um, a Goofy movie, but I was definitely like, there's nothing impressive about this animation. It's fine. I'm not knocking it. It's great for TV, but if you're putting this on a movie screen, animation-wise, it's kind of like, who cares? Uh, well, th this was definitely a step up from the normal TV show. Maybe not in terms of animation quality and effects and stuff, but... Uh, absolutely the background like even when it opens up and it's got like a military base uh, just the amount of shading that are on the guys and the level of detail that they show not not to mention that i'm i don't remember if widescreen was like the format because when i when i saw this just recently like it has a nice widescreen format and all the background map paintings are like widescreen 
which gives it that cinematic look, uh, which definitely is not in the TV show that I remember because the TV show, I'm pretty sure at this point was still formatted for four three. Well, since I have the entire TV show right here, let's check an episode from their final from is that season three to six? Let's see three. They all say three. Here we go. I'm playing what seems to be the. Uh, not the last one. Okay, I'm playing a late a late episode. It is in full frame. So this the TV show is entirely in full frame. Just out of curiosity, did you hear a school bell or not? I did not. Okay, just curious what comes through on my, on the mic. So if I play a video, that doesn't happen. Good to know. But uh, yeah, it looks like the entire show was was full frame. Uh, there were movies after this, not theatrical, but uh, so there's six seasons, which is. About 68 episodes, uh, which is um, every episode had two stories. There's basically 120 stories. Movies after this, Christmas Miracle on 3rd Street. That should have been the third movie. Uh, Recess All Growed Down. Recess 4 is taking the fifth grade, which they should have waited one more movie for. So they did like really badly name their movies it's kind of like how um now they're making a fourth bad boys movie but they already used the title bad boys forever for the third movie yeah dumbasses <laughs> think so they just, just think always for one. take a second and think bad <laughs> boys four two bad boys four two um that's it well yeah I, I love i love pitching um sequels to like a specific sequel like over on podcast the ride they're always pitching a Batman Forever 2. <laughs> I'm like, that's a great idea. <laughs> it ignores every other Batman. <laughs> yeah, the, the recess story strategy here is a little bit weird because in this movie, which is the first one, I believe, right? Is it just the first theatrical or is it the first recess movie period? A, it, both. It's the only theatrical. Okay, okay. So, so this, uh, the recess movie... The premise is that they've just graduated fourth grade. We watch them uh, play out the final day of fourth grade and they're all like, yeah, you know, we're going to go off for summer camp. But that means that they don't actually take the fifth grade for another like three movies after that. <laughs> Correct. Like maybe they go backwards a little bit. I, I don't know. Or maybe taking the fifth grade is actually like later in that year. Um I'm not going to be finding out because I'm not going to be deleting this 14 gigs of recess I have on my computer in this podcast. You just had to get so, the right? entire recess torrent so you could find the movie? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> not on YouTube if anyone's... Cause I, you know, that's one where it, you think, oh, that would be on YouTube. But then it's not because it's Disney. <laughs> so. It's a it's an interesting strategy, too, though, to have them actually progress through the grades. Because if you show that they graduate fourth grade and go in the fifth grade then the assumption is that at some point they're going to have to graduate fifth grade and go into middle school and so on and so on. Unlike almost every other cartoon series, Doug and Simpsons and almost, you know, pretty much South everything Park, I can think of. South Park did that. Um, for a few. Well, I think now, now yeah. they're just stuck in the, are they stuck in the fifth grade or the fourth grade? But I remember it's like, it was season three and they're like, they're now in the fourth grade. Right. <laughs> Which didn't, of course that didn't matter at all, but that also might be a reason like this movie, like I, since I know South Park, like this does have basically the template of South Park without the really dirty jokes and better. Well, okay. Um, better animation, the traditional sense of the word. If you're into South Park animation, that's cool. <laughs> and I'm, I'm trying to, th man, I don't have the, the dates in my head, but I'm pretty sure that, the same time that I wasn't watching this show, South Park was out and I was watching that. 97 was both. So people, you know, more our age, of course, we're watching South Park. Why would we watch Recess? It's stupid, you know? I mean, even if it's occasionally got a good line. And there were some really, you know, good lines in here and stuff. One of the, the other movie I had a podcast yesterday. You can watch it on YouTube, though they will, um, you know, take out the pop songs. It just goes silent when there's a pop song. The Never Ending Story 3 the script of that just will drive you mad. Like just the lines are stupid. Um, it's got a weird Jack Black with the unibrow as, a, as the villain, which is kind of fun actually, but yeah, it's a terrible movie. But so I'm watching this right after I'm like, Oh, here's some, you know, well-written lines in this movie. That's nice. Here's some jokes that at least I'll give a little <laughs> chuckle to if I'm not just like laughing like a loon at it or something. I mean, not not to sound like an absolute Disney apologist at this point, but I do feel that even if uh, 
everything else kind of falls flat with a Disney movie under the Disney name, you are going to get at least somebody cared about revising the script and making sure that some of the jokes don't just completely fall flat. Uh, I don't know if that has to apply to these like cartoon series versions of Disney movies, but it does seem like it would have to go through at least a modicum of quality checks versus, uh, I don't know, never ending story three. Yeah. Uh, German production. Another, um, another funny thing with that though, was, uh, that, I mean, it's, I guess it's a pretty common trope, but also using the we're leaving. So now we're going to play born to be wild on the soundtrack. Now in the <laughs> never ending story three, it's even worse. Cause, um, excuse me. It's the rock creature riding his uh, motor, his bike or something with his kid on it, doing Born to Be Wild. I kind of liked that part, man. And the rock creature singing it, right? I, so it's well, like, oh, and it's I like, do, <laughs> I remember that part. I like that part. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, by the way, if anyone's wondering, I'm just coming off of a cold. And since it's Japan, my my wife gave me my my lunchtime after lunchtime pills in a in a My Melody pill box. Uh, this being Japan, <laughs> what's in that? What, any good stuff? I don't. I don't know this stuff. I don't even know what it is. I'm, I'm, just, I'm like a hippie in the late '60s, man. I'm just popping whatever pills you give me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> last night actually there was one there. I really legit didn't know what it was. I, I think she might have tossed me a sleeping pill. I don't know. Hopefully, it's not arsenic. Arsenic and old lace, that sort of thing. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of taking random drugs in the 60s, this movie had an interesting backstory plot where they show that the origin of James Wood's sort of evil character, he originally came up with the rest of the characters. Uh, Doc, Dr. Fair, what is it? Or <laughs> Principal Pickley? Pick, Pick, Pickler? Oh, now that you said it two ways, I have to look at Wiki again. <laughs> <laughs> prickly, I think. Prickly. Uh, Principal Prickly. Uh, that, that he grew up with this James Wood character, and James Wood was actually um, was going to be the principal originally, and then he wanted to institute this no recess policy. But it was it was funny because everybody is an ultra hippie. Um, they they've got the partridge color style school bus that drives up they're school all doing itself. like the everything's groovy you know peace signs and stuff like they're basically they're smoking weed because there's even a scene where they show the principal's office and there's like incense burning in the corner and they got like black light posters uh and this is the school itself so i just thought yeah, that why was... they why they repaint the school i mean they just yeah you keep that paint job what are you doing <laughs> Well, because of the the brutalism movement uh, well, mm. and like just the abstract aspect of like the eighties, pretty much wiped yeah. all that out. But but yeah. that was a kind of a cool backstory of showing that they were hippies, but that this evil principal he was just using the hippie movement to kind of get into power, and then he has some pretty bulletproof logic, in my opinion, because once he gets in the power and he looks around and he's like. You know, this is the old way, man. Like, we got to shake things up. And that would be shaking things up. But although he wants to remove recess in order to shake things up, I never really understood his extreme motivation for wanting to cancel recess. I know there was like a short little explanation, but nothing really felt, you know, did was he touched during a recess? Did his, like, was his parents killed by a recess? It kind of had that level of nefarious wanting to like get vengeance at recess. You know, James Woods gets uh, very obsessive about lots of opinions. <laughs> he makes the perfect cartoon villain for sure. Oh God. Yeah. I just, I don't know for whatever reason recently, I just have keep ending up with movies where James Wood is the villain recently. So I, I, I've in, in the past six months without trying, I've probably seen like 10 movies where James Woods is like the villain. So <laughs> Well, also J James Woods being a villain at a school is also its own little subgenre. If I'm not mistaken, I think the first time that I saw James Wood was in Welcome Back, Cotter, which is also about school, and it also mm -hmm. has James Woods in it. So there's some weird connection between James Woods acting creepy and TV shows about school. Was he a regular on that show? I wanted well. I mean, he wasn't a regular because he wasn't in Cotter's class. But I think he either taught at the school or I might just be making things up though because I'm also just having a fever dream induced by drugs. Maybe 
Right. I just, I haven't seen Welcome Back, Cotter since like 1990. And when I wouldn't have known who James Woods was, so I wouldn't have recognized him. But I did watch. Oh no! A you know what? Um, James Woods guest starred in the first episode of season one as a drama teacher, and I guess maybe he never shows up again. But I've seen the one of the, I guess my one of my guilty pleasures is Welcome Back, Cotter. Uh, so I have seen the pilot episode probably ten or more times. So it feels like he was in a bunch of them. Okay. But- well, when I, I have to make, you know, flashcards or drill cards for students sometimes, and, and I have on more than one occasion when I need to make the teacher card use the picture of Cotter. So, <laughs> so I, I got that going for it. Um, one one thing, just as far as like weird conspiratorial stuff that came to mind, I, I'm, I mean, I could have looked it up. I'm just blanking on the name. The, um, the, the, the weather array that was in uh, Alaska and is now on boats, I think. Harp. And it's, Yes, harp. There we go. Because all I could think was CERN. I'm like, I know it's not CERN. So, but it, yeah, harp, yeah. the high altitude active research project. I don't, I don't know the rest of it by heart anymore. But that kind of felt a little bit like what he's doing in this. Uh, I don't know, remember where harp was in 2000. If that was something that you know came up on coast to coast a lot at the time. But oh yeah, no harp. Harp. I'm pretty sure goes into the man. 80 i'm pretty sure 80s definitely oh, 90s. The, the project yeah i'm talking about when people would be talking about it i'm not well sure. yeah there, there was there was a documentary and a book called angels don't play uh this harp right that, is, that's kind of what i was thinking about the book is that late 90s i'm actually looking this up because i have i've important. actually read it but it was like seven years ago 1995 oh, okay. it was published so so the harp conspiracy theories predate this movie being out in 97 right or 2001 so th- 2001 series was 97. So I was kind of wondering if that was kind of in the back of their mind. And here, of course, it's just a weird laser because that's much cooler than, you know, an array of um, well, it, it dishes could, that aren't It could doing be anything. the same thing, though, because all Harp is is a huge antenna grid where they basically, like each of these satellite dishes slash antenna things, each antenna uh, has a certain power to it, but they have all the antennas focus on the exact same spot in the ionosphere. One of the many things that Harp does. So technically, if you could consolidate the same concept into this weird laser that they're creating in the Recess movie, you could be doing the same thing. And al- although he's talking about changing the moon's orbit, and they show early on in the, this movie that they have a smaller version of the green laser and they're using it to levitate a safe up into the air. And w- which is weird because TJ sees this, the main character, and he immediately is like, oh, they're doing evil experiments. So just like all he saw was them lifting uh, a safe into the air. Like that, I, I don't know, it didn't seem evil to me at the, at the time. But the premise is that he's trying to move the moon. So I think they're actually going to zap the moon with this laser and kind of like pull it or move, like rearrange it so it's in a different orbit. Yeah, I think they just deflect it for a few seconds, thus changing the orbit. Um, yeah, my note here is levitating a safe is not a crime if you can manage it, you know? Um, this is not me actually making like a connection, but this is just my own like synchronicity experience. Another thing I watched this week was a Star Trek Voyager episode, probably from about the year 2000, in which they find like a Borg antenna in space. That's And that's dri- an antenna again, but it's a driving seven of nine insane because it just transmits to Borg. But it looked like almost the same as the laser in this movie. Like the design was like really similar. I mean, if, if you know, this was kind of Borg green and just the shape of it and like how it kind of arced around was kind of similar. So that was kind of weird. <laughs> The, the episode was Infinite Regress of Voyager, uh, if anyone's wondering. <laughs> Voyager was probably, in retrospect, my f- favorite out of all the different uh, Star Trek spinoffs. I like Voyager. I always, I always push Deep it out as... A little bit. Yeah. I always push it out as the, uh, the Beach Boys of Star Trek, where it's got the best stuff, the absolute best, and it's got the absolute worst, um, <laughs> but often benefits from the fact that it's also the trippiest Star Trek. So, um, is it... It is the one I'm watching the, the most of right now because some of my Trekkie friends, that's that's where they're moving through on their podcast. So um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm knee deep in Voyager at the moment. <laughs> I did write down the exact phrases that the characters in this movie say that they're using. I don't think any of them are necessarily real except for the laser, but there's a plutonium turbine. There's okay. a global electrode. 
which kind of looked like one of those things in the Frankenstein movie where it's just a metal sphere that connects out into the air and it kind of, you know, makes electrical connections. Uh, there's the laser and then an electron pulse generator. And a pulse generator is real. So technically an electron pulse generator wouldn't be real. But none of those things really imply changing the moon's orbit. So I don't know if, no. if they're if this is revelation of the method where they're actually telling you how you can change the moon's orbit, or it might just have been for a TV show plot. Well, I mean, uh, it could be nuclear powered and you need to cool plutonium using a turbine, right? So maybe it's not, yeah, but it's the, not like the, tur the plutonium turbine was like the size of a person. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a nuclear physicist, but I'm, I'm just trying to like work with uh, your, um, they're actually <laughs> telling you something here concept. So, <laughs> um, but the yeah. other one was, uh, the other one. Yeah. That just, that does sound like just like a uh, children's show sci-fi gobbledygook, but, I don't know. Could be something. <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's not. Uh, Dude, it, well, but it is gobbledygook and it's not something. Although maybe it could be. It, there was another thing. I guess this is a little bit of a trope about movies or TV shows when kids get out for summer. But it's like the one kid that wants to hang out and he's got all these big plans and all the other friends are going off to different camps and, and stuff. Um, and one of them is even said like, like, you know, we don't identify with the word camp. We, we do something else here. Um, uh, but that did ring true to me. I actually remember that being a thing, uh, when I was growing up, when you would get summer break and then all your friends, you're expecting to hang out with them. And then they all go off to weird, like space camps and stuff instead. And, uh, yeah. did you go through any of that? Does that, is that a big culture where you're at too? Um, well, I was kind of on both ends of it because there were some summers where, yeah, I'm an only child, too. So summer, you know, I, I remember watching a bunch of bizarre PBS shows in the morning in the summer because there's nothing much going on. So uh, there was some summer boredom. I did go to camps. Now, this is in movies and TV. They always suggest that you're going to go to camp for like two months, you know, whereas I never went to a camp for more than a week. I taught at a place where kids would come for two weeks. Um but, um, you know, two months seems kind of excessive, expensive, <laughs> expensive <laughs> and excessive. Yeah. <clears throat> I think um, I, I think I did the one or the two week for one summer and it was like the wee blows, which I don't it's not exactly like a Boy Scout kind of thing. It was a YMCA version of this where you could oh, like wee, work wee blows actually up. would be a would be a Boy Scout thing. It's a thing between Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts for like one year. OK, well, it was it was a wee blow thing. Weird uh, fact, I was actually an Eagle Scout. <laughs> I was, yeah, I, I was asked not to come back, apparently. My parents told me <laughs> later. Okay. When, when I was an Eagle Scout, though, I, I remember going for my board review, and by that time, I'd um, flipped over to the school club version, which was the Explorers, where I could wear a cool green shirt, not the dorky tan shirt, uh, and we'd go camping with girls, right? So when I got my Eagle Scout, I went in with, you know, like, late 90s, like, emo long hair and stuff, so that was kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sitting for the border review, everyone else looks like they're about to go into the military, and I'm sitting there looking like I'm, you know, about to play bass for the Clash. <laughs> There's this also is kind of oddly related to Cub Scouts and Weeblos and all this stuff, but in this movie, the song John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt comes up. I hated that song when I was a child, by the way. I did too. I hated it so <laughs> much, and I used this as an opportunity to figure out where the hell it came from. Like, what was. What's the history behind this guy? And uh, it sounds, I'm not sure if I fully got this put together, but it sounds like it started as a song influenced by something called Jan Janssen, uh, which was like a, like a German or like a Norwegian song that was talking about how people were getting their names butchered as they would come over to the Americas. Uh, because if your name was Jan Janssen, but it was spelled like it was, like Jan Jansen or John Johnson. Um, so the, the song started as, you know, my name is Jan Janssen. I come from Wisconsin and there's a whole bunch of other lyrics that go with it. But I think that the joke was, was that it's, you couldn't actually pronounce it Jan, Jan Janssen because no one in America would have called it Jan Janssen. It would have been Jan Jansen or John Johnson. I come from Wisconsin. So mm -hmm. it was like a, like a, a very meta self-aware song that your name is now toby your name is now john johnson it's not jan johnson anymore 
Well, I had the thing. I mean, look at look at the name on the screen here. I had like the opposite thing in my family where my name became even more confusing because um, it's it's commages, right? Which is like what? I mean, no one can even pronounce that. Weirdly, they can in Japan. It's all Japanese sounds, but um, in America, you know, people just butcher. Which I quit caring. I've I've gotten shouted out on other podcasts like you, know, Matt. Comic guys or comic gay. I'm like, that's fine, whatever, don't care. But uh should be the, the original version would be Koenigse, which is German for King's Lake. That makes perfect sense. But no, my Big name Matt actually T. <laughs> Yeah, my colleges actually doesn't mean anything. It's butchered Koenigse. <laughs> so they made it make make less sense. Koenigse, Koenig. How would you turn that into an anglicized name easily? Koenigse, Koenigse. Co- Koenig, I guess, like like Water Koenig or something. I don't know, which I still think is a, kind of a weird name. <laughs> Honestly, if you want to anglicize it, we're going to have to scrap it and just come up with a brand new. You should have to be Smith all over again. Well, I went to high school with a guy whose family had come from Indian. We're just able to choose their name. So he went with the name Matthew Matthews, which that's a baller <laughs> move, especially <laughs> when you're like 11 move. years old. <laughs> so, as far as I know, he's still rocking that name in his 40s. So, you know, all power to him. But... <laughs> Um, and not not that this even matters, but I do feel like I need to point out I don't typically trust somebody that has two first names of the name until I get to know them. Like right off the bat, I just assume that they're a plant. Although I don't think Matthews with a plural S at the end, that doesn't count to me as a first name anymore. That's an official last name. Right. So again, baller move for eleven year old. It is. Um, yeah. <laughs> got, and, you know, um, if, yeah, if anyway, they but, gave me that chance, I co- totally would have been like. Spike Killer or something like you know that <laughs> would have been Power, the name that I would have gone for, is, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Max Power. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm sure there's some other terrible names I can come up with. Uh, I'll just spit them out if they come to mind. Yeah. So anyway, when John 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 John's playing John Jingle, I can't even say it anymore. But uh, I guess that's the point of the song. Um, I was like, oh my god, I'm, I'm gonna hate this movie. The rest is just like you know, like the most obvious choices from the '60s, which is fine. Um, Dancing in the Street, of course, the ultimate version of that is the video with uh, David Bowie and Mick Jagger, specifically the last shot where they wiggle their asses together in close up. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen that video? It's been a while. It's not on the top of my playlist. I do remember vaguely. And if, if you want to see a really fun one, there's a version where someone would like take the music out and they'd redo the sound effects so they're all like slightly more absurd. So. <laughs> <laughs> there's no music there's heavy around. breathing yeah heavy breathing bowie jumps he's like oh <laughs> but there's no music so uh i might even hi- even more highly recommend the the version where they take the music out <laughs> um i also i also think that this is a decent point is that the john jacob jingleheimer smith the jan jansen and i don't know if you heard of michael finnegan uh song these are all kind of known as like infinite songs that just go on forever and ever. There's only a handful of them that really exist out there that are like fairly popular. Another one is like the lamb chop sing along the, the song that never ends. Yes. It goes on and on my friend. Uh, But have you, have you heard the Michael Finnegan one, Michael Finnegan whiskers on his chin again. Uh, He's a captain. So the wound, the wind blew him in again. And then they say, poor Michael Finnegan, let's begin again. And they and it just goes over and over and over. Yeah, like and I might have heard that once or twice. Again, doesn't work in Japan because a uh, uh, chin, chin, chin's a penis in Japan. So <laughs> the chin chin that <laughs> <laughs> there, there's just something very uh, eerily like Dr. Ewan Cameron's psychic driving MK Ultra to like a song that literally never ends. Like there's something that breaks the regular mental pattern where it could be a joke. I remember singing the song that never ends because it was so it was so funny. Like, oh, you could be annoying. And the joke is that you're never going to stop being annoying. But also, I can still remember those lyrics because it was just like four lines that you just sang over and over and over again. So I don't know. There's something to those. I re- I've had my own like infinite regress song recently in my mind. Um, and maybe it's cold meds, so but I can't recall it now. If I, but uh, yeah, sometimes you end up making your own up and they just kind of play in your head until you drive yourself insane. You know, I would say <laughs> small world kind of counts. I don't, I don't think it was made to be an infinite. It kind of was it was in, really it's supposed to go into the new arrangement. Right. So it always needs to blend into the next segment seamlessly. So I, I think it does count because of the, technical difficulties of making it happen 
just ended up making it do that. And this, uh, in music terms, this movie stands um, alone a little bit in that I can't think of a lot of other Disney movies that we've seen so far in our coverage of theatrical animations where they play like another soundtrack and they make references to like actual popular music. Almost every, even the Doug movie, I think a lot of it was original score stuff. Yeah. Uh, again, it's um, music's good, but these are all the most obvious possible choices which is Dancing in the Street, Born to be Wild, uh, One, you know, the Three Dog Night, Henry Nilsson song, Incense and Peppermints, Wipeout, Purple Haze, just super uh, Let the Sun Shine In segment of, of uh, the Fifth Dimension thing. Uh, it is funny, I, I didn't realize this till after the movie, but um, Mikey's operatic voice and, and Green Tambourine is uh, Robert Goulet. So I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> when Mikey starts singing it, you're actually hearing Robert Goulet at those points. <laughs> and there's a couple of jokes that they squeeze in that are music related. The the most obvious one was a, there was a Pink Floyd uh, where one of the teachers says, uh, "You leave them kid like we don't we don't need this education." And someone's like, "You leave those kids alone." Oh yeah, I, I wrote something. Like, I wrote we don't need no education at that point. Just as a um, play setter. <laughs> A little after the musical tenor of this movie, but that's fine. I mean, I think it maybe goes without saying, and maybe people don't you know, know me that well. But yes, the going back to ridiculous psychedelia was easily my favorite part of the movie. So <laughs> there was also a hint in the same way that I mentioned in the Doug movie, but this movie starts with this premise that conspiracies are pretty much like a normal aspect of life, and you just kind of take them for granted. Uh, which doesn't persist too much longer in TV shows outside of this. I think this is the tail end, right? Because it's the early 2000s. And as you venture into the later 2000s, conspiracy theory culture starts to get a little bit more politicized, I think. So this is like one of those last examples of that just being ubiquitous. Because these are, I mean, these kids are the conspiracy um, contingent of the recessed little microcosm, right? Because there's there's a power structure, there's the uh, black market with that one kid that wants to sell things to everyone. Um, so these are the yeah. you know th- these guys are doing the Mission Impossible sort of um, schemes. The, 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 that's that's the conspiracy slash spy contingent of this school. And the the animation style too. There was a few frames, man, where I had to pause it, and I was like this is a frame from the Simpsons or this looks like, uh, like the critic. Um, and there was another one life with Louie, which was a cartoon that was on Saturday mornings. This might've been after you stopped watching. Cause I Louis think Anderson was one of mine too. Or, or no, the bigger Louis, Louis. Yeah, it was, it was no, Louis Louis Anderson. Anderson. and the, the cartoon was called life with Louie, I believe, but the way that they drew the, the character's teeth, uh, was almost identical to how they drew the teeth in this movie. And I know that sounds like a very specific detail, but it was like a dead giveaway to me. Well, it's just like the thing with Atlantis where um, um, the the artist whose name I really should know. Yeah, I'm just like my, sorry, my encyclopedia knowledge of random crap today is like clouded by, by cold meds. But uh, he was like, my, uh, Mike Magnolia, Mike Magnolia, he's like, um, yeah, what those those hands are perfect. And I was like, yeah, you taught him how to draw those. <laughs> so they just learned his lesson and he liked the results. So that that's kind of, you know, maybe there's like a teeth guy, a teeth animator who <laughs> maybe is like between both. I, I guess you wouldn't have a full teeth animator, but a character animator, sure. <laughs> um, let's see. I've I also had a a note here that the progression as a kid that at the end of every grade you get this big break and you come back anew and you've got like new life experiences and stuff. It has this very specific feeling of um, maybe a strained analogy, but this movie is kind of about the moon, like the moon cycles. So it's almost like if you care about those moon cycles and you notice, Oh, here's the new moon or whatever. And you actually live your life to that. It probably does feel like there's more of like a constant progression, con- like you're constantly going to like next levels. But as soon as we get out of school, for me, time just kind of like starts blending together. You don't really get like a dedicated. Well, you do as as a freaking teacher, but in no, the normal I don't. life, <laughs> but you don't. 
Um, I was going to throw out the Japanese thing. One, I, I work for a private company, so if school's out, we're busier. <laughs> Because they're sending, there's some parents just like saddle their kids with us for like, you know, all day. They're just like there for two weeks. They're basically going to camp, right? But they're running around in our lobby as the camp. But um, Japan, uh, between school year, school year ends in early March. School year begins in early April. April is considered the beginning of year in Japan. I mean, we celebrate New Year's on January 1st, but the New Year's really April 1st, which makes sense. That's near the, um, the equinox, right? But yeah, one... A little less than one month of vacation there. Uh, they get maybe one a full month of vacation August only, and then maybe three weeks around Christmas. Uh, usually not Christmas. Christmas everyone's working at school, so maybe like two or three weeks around New Year, but not including Christmas. That that are those are the big holidays. So they're smaller. I think theoretically the time in school's about the same, except the kids will go do clubs and stuff during their holidays. So. Um, I have a lot of students that even during um, the breaks, they have a shitload of homework and need to go do kendo every other day, you know? It seems so untenable and like impractical now. And I guess my understanding is that summer break was kind of rooted in sending your kids back to the farm so they could help, you know, pick, you know, do all the harvest with the parents and then they could go back to school once the harvest was over. And that was the real reason that they had these big breaks like that. Um, but now it's it's almost like part of the culture of school. But the impractical part is that since nobody else gets to go on summer break, like you're just expecting parents and whoever to be able to adapt to no longer having state mandated babysitters. And again, I'm speaking from the American point of view here, which always felt so weird. Uh, so like as a parent, you know, you don't get three months off for summer to now be paying attention to your kid, but the kid has nothing else to do unless you enroll them into some kind of a camp or whatever. It's very, uh, it feels very unfair. Yeah. I mean, it is, it, it, it depends on the family situation, I guess, too. So, um, I, here's a plus for a multi-generational household and only having one kid, I guess, but it's never been a concern because if uh, we can't handle it, there's. The aunt lives down the street and the grandparents live in the house. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so we and also my daughter was more mature than I, I am by like age five. That also helped. <laughs> so what do you think objectively about taking away recess? Um, I'm the guy who, has, like I said, I was I, I had a cold this week and on Wednesday, especially I was just kind of, you know, stuck in the house and I was going nuts, you know, Um not I, I at least want to take a walk around the neighborhood. So uh, for me, that's a recess. Just yeah, getting outside is important. Um, I think they even mentioned, like, why don't we have some classes outside, which I always think that's a good idea if it's, you know, not raining or whatever. So, well, that was um, the hippie principle uh, before principal um, prickly becomes who he is. That's that's where he starts out as his baseline. He's like, let's get out of, you know, let's get out of these walls, man. Let's go outside and, and learn inside of nature. It's very, uh, I'm all Aristotelian. into that, man. I'm into that, man. I mean, I did environmental education for several years where, yeah, my classes were outside, man, among the trees. I, I remember a couple classes I had that were outside or the teacher was just like, we can go and do this outside. And, uh, I didn't know how good I had it at that time, but also it just felt like, he just wants to be able to have an easy day. He just sends us out of the room and then you can just do whatever the hell he wants. And you just got kids like roaming around the rest of the, the school campus. No, I remember having an actual English class or history class or something outside where we actually did the class outside. Um, like right outside of the classroom, I think. But uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't remember us having uh, getting to roam around. But I, I do think there is a plus. Just kind of it's a nice day. What are we doing in this room, you know? <laughs> I can't stand rooms with no moving air that I closed my windows for this podcast. And my main concern is it'll get so stuffy. It'll start driving me insane. You know, if, if that happens, then I'll just open this and you'll hear more birds. So, <laughs> so I, so I remember going to school both in upstate New York and in Southwest Florida, which have completely different climates. Um, and I distinctly remember that in South, once we moved to Florida, uh, we had gym in the mornings usually, and then recess. And I can't tell, I remember how bad that smell was right after gym was over and everyone's cramming into the next 
classroom that's not gym or after you have lunch and you go out and for recess for, I think it was like 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And then you get into the next class and it was just non, it just always smelled like stinky, sweaty kids every time. Oh, I'm living that right now. It's just on uh, my Thursday. So yesterday for today for you, um, I had a class of second graders. And for the past three weeks, I'm like, one of you kids is like, just like gassing. It's like, you know, Cyclone B, C, and D with your feet there, you know? <laughs> I don't know which kid it is. I'm guessing it's one of the boys, but <laughs> I'm like, I don't know which one of you kids is gassing me, but somebody is. <laughs> um, some of the ubiquitous conspiracy theory nods here is that, so all the kids go off to different camps. TJ's the only one that's left behind. And as you do, you go and start hanging out outside of your school on summer i don't know i didn't actually he does do that, live across the screen it seems so it's fair but still uh so but he's hanging out and he sees that the gymnasium's like filling up with green light and stuff so he starts to go and inspect and then he tells all of his other friends about it and when they start talking about it the first things that that come up are oh they've probably got um moon rocks and alien eggs and they finally this crate they're gonna open up and I just re- I remember thinking like, yeah, that's that ubiquitous feeling of conspiracy theory that just persisted. Like you didn't even have to say it was conspiracy theory. If you just found uh, like a crate somewhere or a barrel, you'd be like, oh, there's probably alien eggs inside this thing. Just because I guess I lump aliens into conspiracy theory, but I, it just felt like that was the premise of the 90s, early 2000s. Alien. Well, yeah, I guess alien autopsies about this time, that sort of thing. So. Um, although I get, I get a little obsessed with the school across the street. I was, I'm thinking my, my grandparents lived in uh, Smyrna, Delaware, and their house was like catty cornered from the high school. And one, I just fascinated because I'm from Atlanta. So when you're a kid, it's like, wow, it's a school in the place so far away. I wonder what that's like. But, you know, you'd walk by it a lot. And I would I think I would have noticed some green light coming from their gymnasium during the summer. <laughs> but I wouldn't and have had my there- cohorts in Smyrna, Delaware. So it would have been more of a... Uh, would have been more of a Mel Gibson conspiracy theory sort of thing. And in New York, I did grow up really close to my school. So you would go, I mean, you would walk by and usually people would sneak in and use the like jungle gym and stuff. Uh, And later on, people would sneak in and smoke pot back there. But it was basically kind of like a community uh, area for people to just like hang, whether or not school was in session or not. Let me think, what do I live nearby where I just keep my eye on? the train station's really close and you know, like they recently rebuilt the station for worse. Oops. But uh, yeah, I was, you know, very keen on what was happening. There are no conspiracies there. The Seven Eleven closed. So we we're like, what's going to happen to that for like two years. And now it's just some crappy storage company. So there is no convenient convenience store anymore in Japan. That's like a bummer. Cause usually, you know, there's a convenience store everywhere, but now that, you know, labor shortages are creeping in, they're actually having to hire people from abroad. A lot of, and also I think, the number of convenience stores that we had actually was untenable. So, but it's too bad. The one next to my house closed. <laughs> there um, is a drugstore nearby, which on the wall, you'll love this. Um, it says the quote, the quote, real unquote drugstore is written in large white letters on the side of the building, which I, I think is really funny. The <laughs> real drugstore, you know, I think real is in all caps too. Um, uh, so this is another weird thing that I was, I noticed this as an ongoing trope in this and pretty much not just movies, but maybe culture in general, but the affinity that people show to the school that they went to, even if they hate the school. So for example, TJ and his, and his gang here in recess, when they see that the school is kind of being taken over and even after they like, they get inside, they, they confirm it. It's not just suspicion anymore. Uh, they see that they're using it to create this harp style conspiracy from inside their school they almost are like this is our school like we can't let them get away with this in our school and it's like well hey you guys are about to be out of this school but also the the teacher and the principal are sort of the antagonists uh outside of this movie where now they kind of come together and fight like this ultimate evil you know what i mean like the two sides combine but typically it's almost like the kids can't wait to get out of this school. In fact, everyone can't wait to get out of this school. They're all cheering and stuff for the school year to be over. And what makes it so that kids that normally don't like their school, they still feel like, well, 
yeah, but it's our school and we have to protect it. I mean, it, it comes to mind is like Red Dawn, Terror Squad. Um, there, there's a whole bunch of movies in the 80s where kids would like either take over their school. There was one where like the school gets taken hostage and the kids have to take it back even though they kind of hate the principal and stuff. Do you, you know what I'm talking about? I was trying to look up the name of this one. I'm pretty sure the Simpsons did it. <laughs> well, but, but I mean, there was like an eighties movie. No, no, I, I know you mean something movies. else too, but I'm just like, uh, I, over I, the I, edge, you maybe me. toy yeah. soldiers, toy soldiers. Oh, thinking about okay. 91. Okay. But what, what is it about that school affinity, which definitely goes into college too, I guess it's a little bit creepier. If you see, adults walking around with like alum like elementary school alumni shirts or middle school <laughs> alumni shirts um and even maybe high school unless you're uh you're al um from married with children where like his glory days were in high school right but outside of that college is kind of acceptable that you're allowed to hold that affinity towards your school until you're like an old person and there's something normal with that i guess but that, you it's, to join the alumni association and contribute money. <laughs> well, I guess I guess so. Um, yeah, like I, I honestly didn't have that bad a time bopping through school. You know, a few math class I hated. Me and German didn't get to uh, go together well. But otherwise, I didn't have that bad a school experience. I was pretty good at giving them just enough of what they wanted while off so going off and playing in punk bands and stuff. So I, I feel like I got the best of both worlds, but I don't have that much affinity. My friends that I still keep in contact these days are people I podcast with. And those are my, my muso friends. Those are the people I played in bands with. I, I barely keep in contact with my actual high school friends. Um, one interesting well, that's thing. the point is like the, the affinity towards this like state, the state mandated thing that you have to do and be subjected to the authority. It's, like the affinity to school when it's not college almost seems like um, like Stockholm syndrome in a weird way. Here's an interesting one. Just, uh, I mean, I, you know, always giving the perspective here in Japan, but I think in Japan um, it's really the junior high that people are focused on. Like people are, it's like, I'm having a reunion party with my junior high class, like not high not, school, not, not high school class. Well, high school, I think the high school is, kind of the most difficult school in Japan because everyone is getting ready for the university entrance tests. So actually, once you get to university, it's like, okay, you pass the test. We're going to chill and you can have fun for four years before we throw you into the corporate grinder of Japan Inc., you know? So university is actually like chill out time for most Japanese. High school is the, the, the one that sucks. So you don't have friends in high school. You're too busy studying. Where junior high, you had, you had a little more time for fun, I guess. So that that's what they have their affinity for junior high. That's interesting. Like it, it's 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 such a known and accepted part that you're just stressed out studying the entire time that you're not even going to want to have a reunion. Be, um, like the reunion would just be you stressed out and studying again, right? Correct. And um, I, I guess university is assuming you're getting blackout drunk and don't remember it anyway. You don't, you don't remember your friends from university. I don't know. I'm sure they have, you know, I mean, you, they do have high school reunions and, and university reunions, I guess, as well. But uh, yeah, junior high seems to be the biggie. That's like, oh, those are my friends for life from junior high. So definitely not the US five, but we go to school with the same people from often from first to 12th grade if you don't move. So where um, I, for me, well, yeah, the fourth grade, I went to a completely different school and then basically went to school with the same people till I graduated. Uh, again, Japan, you take a test for your junior high and go with completely different people. Then you take a test for high school, go with completely different people. So there's like, you're going, usually going to school with very different sets of people. Uh, the school, my daughter, she's in junior high now and the, the school she got into, actually, you do continue through high school, but that's kind of weird in Japan. So but she didn't have to take a test this year. So good for her. <laughs> yeah. That that's another weird aspect of <clears throat> maybe smaller towns, but where you're going to be with the same people, like your entire, like from elementary school to middle school, to high school, it's pretty much like the same faces over and over. Although me, I got expelled from high school and I had to go to another high school. Um, and this was a, a life changing moment for me because the second high school that I went to, I loved it. Like I liked the people there. I liked the teachers. I liked the campus. Like everything about the second high school that I had to go to as a punishment was so much better. I don't think I ever would have finished out 
high school at the first one that I started at, it was literally like a, it was an indoor prison. Um, and the second one that I went to was kind of like an open floor plan where the whole entire school is outside. You'd go into a door to like the classroom, but the second you leave a classroom door, you're outside again. Like there was no such thing as indoor hallways in the entire place. And that was such a crazy difference in mindset versus the other one where you never went outside. Like unless you had uh, some sort of a gym class or if you went outside to eat during lunch, but otherwise you're inside with fluorescent lightings uh, encapsulated by these like the stone walls that you would like put your fingers over. They'll have the little ridges that would like bump and stuff as you walked around and the low ceilings. It was, it was so crazy how different the atmosphere has on the psyche. And I always wondered, would I have liked school better if it wasn't always inside in these like fluorescent jail cells? Oh, I had to get outside. Um, yeah, my high school was a, basically was that indoor prison. So it sounds like a hippie design, your second high school, man. Um, but yeah, from I think I went to the lunchroom once, decided the smell was awful and just stopped eating lunch. So every lunch I just I remember the, the first year I was hanging out on the, the very front steps of the school with the goth girls. So it was fun. And then the rest of the time I just like go outside and, you know, it was warm. People would quickly follow me. And when it was cold, it might take a few minutes. And then there'd be like three people. I was like, OK, well, if they're coming to hang out with me in 32 degree weather, I guess they're my friends. <laughs> yeah, the old, <clears throat> I, I distinctly remember the only reason people would ever go outside in my first high school was if they were going to sneak into the woods and smoke weed. That was pretty much the only reason anyone ever had to leave the actual uh, school canvas. No, we were findable. We were right outside the school. We weren't hiding. So, um, but yeah, I guess even at that age, I was like, I need to get outside, you know? So yeah, I, I understand that. I, I couldn't handle your first high school. I'm pretty sure. And, and even mine, I, I mean, again, my school wasn't so bad, uh, good school, but it did have that indoor prison thing. And I did need to, you know, get the hell outside. <laughs> so if you, if you can't tell, I absolutely hated school. I hated every <laughs> part of it. <laughs> oh, I don't want to redo any of that. I'm just like, I'm like, I could have, I could have had a much worse experience. And my muso friends, again, they went to a much crappier school, which is the one I was supposed to go to originally. So um, if I had followed in their footsteps, I probably would have had a much worse time. Probably a better time socially, though. <laughs> It was funny, yeah. When 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 the band when my band in high school was really kicking it, uh, I think I was in there. They had like two pages in their yearbook dedicated to the band, so I was in like this other high school's yearbook more than mine that year. <laughs> which, that was kind of funny. I think it was like two pictures in my actual school's yearbook and like five or six in this other school's yearbook. <laughs> it's so it's a weird blend because I'm on the fence over if school should be more about knowledge or more about uh, like social adaptation because they both feel incredibly important and like you can't you can't skip either of them right uh with the the pandemic that happened we had a lot of people getting just the knowledge part maybe arguably mm -hmm. they're paying attention and they have the zoom screen up uh but but absolutely missed out on all of like the social interaction for some very important formative years and i I kind of feel bad for any kids that had to go through that and like miss two years of interaction. I've got a lot of, because of how much I hate school, but also my family has educators in it. Um, my girlfriend works at a school. So like I'm still surrounded by school stuff all the time. So just out of morbid curiosity, I follow like the teachers subreddit and other like teacher forums just to, to keep my finger on the pulse of like, I don't know why, I guess <laughs> like what waiting to see it burn and just like feast on all the misery. But uh, it's, it is absolutely insane with the reports that the kids are, the, the teachers are talking about these kids that show up their first day of like second grade had a lot of them not ever having been conditioned in kindergarten and first grade, or if they were in first grade, it was like they were doing a remote thing. And now they're showing up in second and they just don't know how to interact with each other. They like, don't make eye contact. They like, um, I don't know. It's, it feels like we're, we're starting to breed like a new form of human, I think based on just how, systematic and like how the schools were set up to be these little factories and then it's like okay everyone's going to work from home at this weird factory and it screws the whole system up yeah um like see yeah here i mean it's a lot of japanese are already notoriously socially awkward right so it certainly didn't help <laughs> for that but um what what I'm, I'm trying to think again i don't 
Did you or, even notice? Or is it just like they're awkward anyways? So like there's no real difference between the two? No, there is more weirdness, but they didn't have to necessarily do as much remote schooling. Um, the first, let's see, in 2020, I think we did two months of Zoom lessons. Yeah. And then we actually were back in the room again. Uh, Did 2021, you trust the kids to pay attention? Have to what? Did the kids actually pay attention in the remote classes? Um, sometimes. We had to do it one more month in 2021 uh, when there was, you know, there's like, wave whatever they're making up that time but uh yeah we did it one more more month and that one was a little trickier so the 2020 version maybe they're shell-shocked so it wasn't so difficult 2021 a little worse but usually the parent was somewhere on the the other side um my daughter's school until the new school year so until like two months ago every month they'd have at least one day where they would still do remote school you know just for practice which i was like that's kind of lame um <laughs> Um, Japan is still pretty heavily masked up. It's it's warm now, so I think it's now 50-50 how many people are, are are masking around. It's interesting. I work, I teach at two different schools. Uh, the one near my house, I, I think basically almost nobody there bothers anymore. Whereas the other one, it's still like it's it's weird that if I'm not, or that I'm not, I should say. <laughs> well, but, but but Japan was masked up pre-pandemic like they, they yeah were yeah they, society. they were a little more common but um before pandemic i remember there was one private student i had where she would always mask up and a pre-pandemic joke i made is i've been teaching this girl for two years and i have no idea what she looks like so at, at the time that was still very strange like if you're sick yeah you throw one on but um uh it, it is way more heavy now and japan changes very slowly so people are like oh it's chanto now so you know, it's not even like they're worried about it or anything. It's just like, oh, I look weird and my neighbors will judge me if I don't, you know. Uh, my wife does that, so. <laughs> I think my daughter does that. Like, sometimes we're getting in the car, they're putting masks. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> we're in the car. <laughs> but, um, yeah, my, my wife's hypersensitive to that. And my daughter is in the junior high school, which kind of, I guess, condition, it's the smart kids school. The smart kids still mask up, I guess, is the, the vibe they're promoting there. So <laughs> is the so, science in on that? Because I it almost feels like any time they've done so. an actual study, it shows that the masks are sometimes cause more problems than they're intended to solve. No, I well, yeah. Um so I, I told you I was sick this week and the only place I, I will wear a mask now is um, basically, you know, like clinics and stuff. Cause they have a sign saying to do it and it's a clinic. So, okay. And I just like, this thing is making me more sick. You know, <laughs> I was like, just like uh, gasping for air and stuff. Uh, uh, Cause you know, I'm in the waiting room. They don't have the air on the windows are closed. I'm like, Oh God, this is torture, you know? <laughs> So I, I didn't like that, but I think it's really just in Japan. I don't think the science matters. It's purely a social thing at this point. It's like, um, I mean, I'd make an argument that that's pretty much how it's always been. Unless, unless you're literally working with fiberglass or spraying paint or <laughs> mixing like dangerous chemicals and resin, and you're wearing the mask that was rated for that. It almost yeah. feels like every other use of it is more of a social, uh, like, a you know, you're wearing your flair. I don't even think that would be a controversial stance to take in Japan. I think many Japanese would be like, yeah, I'm wearing it because this is what we're doing. And I do what the, you know, I, 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 you know, unity is because the East Asian thing is not so much like individuality. It's like working within the group. So if the group is doing this, I need to keep doing it for me. I did when the Japanese government said, please do it. I was like, okay, I'll do it. I bought cloth ones. Cause I could actually breathe through this. Well, as soon as they're like, okay, you can stop. And at first, like 5% of people stopped. I, I was in that 5%. Um, now that it's kind of warm and you know, it's, it's about 50, 50. So, which is still kind of weird, you know, <laughs> you know what Japan needs is an Aleister Crowley. They need a Japanese Aleister Crowley and everyone can be their own star. Uh, and then they or can start Rasputin. going. Yeah, well, yeah. Or a rat, like a Japanese Rasputin. <laughs> Um, although I don't know, was Rasputin didn't seem like he was much towards individualism because he still kind of served, uh, the, you know, the, the czars. Well, right? my point, I guess, is they need someone to actually enter, uh, change the government in that way, which 
Crowley, I guess he went and been an agent for the government, but I don't feel like he was actually changing higher ups where Rasputin was, right? And I, that that was my thought. Also, I just want to talk about Rasputin because they what tried to kill him eight times. <laughs> So that's always fun. But yeah, I mean, uh, Japan's got the LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party, which is like one of the most conservative parties in the universe, just like fiscally, things like that. So the current thing in Japan is the companies are now making gangbusters because the yen is weak, where everyone else is um, eating doo-doo from the day to day, unless they want to pay us more, which is not ha happening a little bit, but not that much. But yeah, inflation in Japan has just been insane. Like everything that cost whatever last year is now 30 percent more so I, I guess that's the case in the states too to a certain degree yeah it's it's been getting worse and worse in the states i actually was doing research the other day on stanley kubrick because i've been writing a, a little comic i've got i'll do i guess i'll just throw a plug in here now because we're sort of tail end uh but i've been working on this comic called never a straight answer nasacomic.com but uh, one of the premises that we're, that we're trying to make in it is that he was a master chess player as a kid. And I think into his early twenties, he would go to Washington park and in, in uh, New York city and hustle people for their money. And he actually had some notes that I'll paraphrase, but it was like, why would I, why would I go to work and get some job paying, you know, X dollar an hour when I could just go and play chess for 12 hours and make like 20 bucks a day. And I was like, eh, 20 bucks it isn't selling that, that much. So how so take a guess at how much in 1950, which is when this took place, when when Anthony Kubrick or uh, Anthony uh was Stanley Kubrick was playing chess, 1950 made a twenty dollar bill. What would that be today in 2024 in the States? I'll vote a tenfold, making it two hundred bucks. It was two hundred and sixty dollars uh <laughs> for that twenty dollar bill. And the the original inflation year to year back then it was like three percent or something, uh, but obviously we've gone through much bigger jumps lately. But yeah, that's it's just absolutely insane to see how much of that jump uh, is like materialized now. I, 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 I'm I'm mostly focused on Big Mac economics these days. After someone told me a Big Mac meal in the states costs fifteen bucks, I was like, "What the hell?" Yeah, uh, well, yeah, uh, especially if you're gonna like do like a delivery and you get all the regular. I remember distinctly in um, middle school, high school, that McDonald's had these twenty nine cent burger days, uh, and I think it might have been like thirty nine cent cheeseburger. And my my family would go to McDonald's, and my dad would buy like twenty of them. Uh, for you know five bucks or whatever it was <laughs> and just freeze them and just pop a freaking burger out of the freezer put it in the microwave for 10 seconds and you basically had a meal for like over a week yeah Probably years uh, i mean they, they keep forever yeah well the other end to the to my my burger economics is uh, i think a big mac meal in japan currently cost 700 yen and if you were to use a american credit card for that it would come out as about eh, 450 so I was like, that's wow, insane. That, that's very cheap. <laughs> yeah. So may, maybe 15 is on the high end, but I was like, okay, that's where I started to understand. Oh, okay. So if Americans visit Japan right now, it's like, um, you know, you're, it's like how Japanese would visit America in the eighties and just like, you know, be insanely rich. If you visit Japan now, your money will go an insanely long way. I told my, my parents visited last year. I said, come again this year and make, you know, make some bang for your buck while the economy is eating garbage and who knows what's going to happen after the election with the economies worldwide so <laughs> i and i don't care who ends up being the next president i think things are going to take a, a major swerve in one direction <laughs> the other thing too that the the pandemic and inflation and stuff um really like it changed out from under me like i actually saw it happen for the first time in my life saw like the dr dramatic changes but like the rollout of all of the new shrinkflations across the board. And like the, I don't know if you had this too, but like the dollar stores in the States, they're all now like the dollar 25 store or like the dollar 50 store. Like there's really no, I don't think there's any actual dollar stores left. They've all, the, and, and it, it gets to the point where you actually go in the stores and all the logos and all the, you know, all of the imagery and everything in the entire store is now been updated to a dollar twenty five, and when you see that kind of thing happen, you're like, I don't think they're going to be going back down to a dollar. I don't think they're going to take the mm -hmm. the money to like undo all the new graphic updates. And there was there was something really conspiratorial and 
paranoid feeling about how originally in 2020 or so, all of the price jumps were, you know, like temporary uh, inflation. Like it was just to deal with some of the shortages and some of the uh, the supply chain uh, logistics and the prices were going to go back down to some normal state. But the second you start seeing entire companies like rebrand everything to accommodate these new price scales, it's just like, oh man, like we, like that got locked in. Like that was a, that was a checkpoint and you're not going beyond that checkpoint. It's never going to be less than a dollar 25 at the dollar store now. Yeah. Uh, Japan's a little different where the hundred yen stores, there is still a lot of stuff that is still a hundred yen. But there's a lot of stuff that's just straight up 200, 300, 500 yen now as well. So you can still get stuff for 100 yen, but a lot of stuff you cannot. So um, there was another store I saw. It was, was it called 3P? And uh, yeah, that was all 300 yen. So that was a 300 yen store. Um, I, I, I guess the one thing I did make out on, because recently the yen was at the all-time low. So I used that moment to uh, buy a base six, uh, which ended up costing 300 bucks, which is a really good deal. Using my American credit card and Japanese Amazon a currency exchange, base six, yay! You know what a base six? How does is? that work? Because don't you get paid in yen? Uh, but I have money in an American bank account, which I use. That's where my American credit card is uh, comes from. That account, so I, I mean, I'm using American money in that case. So yeah, um, I don't currently have a physical American credit card in Japan. Uh, if I do, um, then I have like insane power of the card, you know. So, but you know, <laughs> they came, why the money less? I had it, but it expired in February. So, and you know, you know, it's, sending credit cards overseas is a little bit of a hairy process. So we haven't done that yet. <laughs> but, Can you just run up a bunch of credit cards uh, with like American credit unions and then just be like, ha ha, can't get me. I'm in Japan. Maybe. <laughs> I ha- ha- haven't been that uh, scammy yet, but I, that, I, Technically, could probably pull off that scam. Hell, I've been an American since 2010, so whatever. <laughs> um, j- just to keep uh, a couple references, I just wanted to throw out near the end. Uh, Patton, weird influence, especially for 2001, uh, slightly mm-hmm. pre 9 11, 2001. Yeah, Griswold. Griswold take. does like a whole Patton thing. Yeah, yeah. Weaponized opera. I thought, oh, Kojak, I thought that was a weird reference, even in 2001. How many kids knew about Kojak in 2001? (laughs) Um, Are you familiar with Telly Savalas' later years, who, who of course, played Kojak? No. Uh, I know know that Kojak was like a cop show. Yeah, right. So Telly Savalas, when he took that role, I think he basically moved into the Universal Hilton right next to Universal Studios and just ended up living there for, for the rest of his life. And uh, <laughs> uh, like he'd just go to the bar. They ended up calling it Telly's Bar. You, they'd hold court. So if you went to hang out at the hotel bar, you'd be just hanging out with Telly Savalas because he was like, like, I want to talk to everybody. He wasn't like standoffish or something. And, uh, you know, I, I guess he, you know, women drinking drugs for the rest of his years died as a, a corpse. Uh, there's a funny Bill Hicks, Hicks bit, I guess, is where he's talking about um, the 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 jogger guy who super healthy guy who Joe fix it or whatever. He has a heart attack. Telly Savalas dies. He's like, Hey, you know, I was living yeah. it. Joe fix. It was jogging and stressing himself out for years. So. Right. And Bill Hicks is here like chain smoking and down in beers. And he's like, I, I did well, it the right way. two years after that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Telly Savalas was a reasonable age. How old was Telly Savalas? I mean, I don't know if he was like the oldest, but he, you know, he was. Da, 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 da. 72. If you're partying that hard and you die at 72, that's a win. <laughs> Little that young, what, but that lets you live that long. Also, that's that's mid-century Hollywood. 72 is old for mid-century Hollywood. So because <laughs> you already look 72 when you're 52, right? And uh, you know, I, I do the Twilight Zone podcast, and we're always like, How old is this actor? It's like, here's a 25-year-old. Okay, the actor is actually 36 and he looks 60. <laughs> Well, and now you've got the inverse of that where you've got like the 20 year old actresses that are getting the like the facelifts and stuff that make them immediately look like they're in their late 30s because typically you don't see someone doing some of those procedures until they're in their 30s, 40s. But people are doing it so much younger that now they look older. So you might actually have a 20 year old playing a 20 year old and people are watching it like, what do they have this 40 year old doing in, in this 20 year old role? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess that's an 
Yeah, because J Law got like every role before she was like twenty five, right? So I don't know if she got any surgery, but you know she was definitely batting above her age uh, as far as the roles they were giving her. So <laughs> I haven't seen her for a few years. Did she age out? Oh, she's not that old, is she? Hmm. No, she just <laughs> she had a recent like uh, she tried doing like a rom com raunchy movie recently. Oh, okay. Yeah. Also, you know, I, I, well, I barely keep track of what comes out these days because other than blockbusters in Japan, we're not going to get the small dramas and especially not the comedies because they don't translate so well. So have you seen the mother movie since you brought up J law, the, the Aronofsky one? <clears throat> yeah. The Aronofsky one. Okay. The, no, <laughs> you haven't seen it. Yeah. I got a few. I'm still catch. Recently, I have been in a bit of catching up on directors. I should have been watching their stuff like the, P.T. Anderson, Wes Anderson. I watched a few of their more recent ones. Uh, still need to watch Phantom Thread and Inherent Vice, but I got Licorice Pizza down. What's the last Aronofsky I watched? I, I've seen everything up to Noah, I think. Okay, you so you've seen Pi recently? and you've seen Requiem for a Dream. and Yeah, I, uh, I've not Fountain. seen his movie in The Sphere. That'd be fun. The Vegas Sphere. That's uh, They play his movie Postcards from Earth or whatever. Yeah. Um, Man, I, man! If they played Mother in the Sphere, that would be one of the most nerve-wracking experiences. <laughs> I don't want to give too much of it away, but it's it's a very stressful movie to watch. Okay, I mean it's something I'm like I gotta watch at some point. Again, with the um with the buying power, I've just recently been buying a bunch of dumb movies on um Blu-ray because it's like four bucks. It's like yeah, sure, I'll buy Air Force One for four dollars on Blu-ray. <laughs> I've got a business proposal for you here. I don't know if this would work numbers wise, but if the dollar is that strong to the yen, couldn't you just start buying up like Pokemon cards and shipping them to the States? Cause you could buy them there cheaper. Uh, not just because like you're at the source, but also because of the exchange rate. And then you could send them over to the States where they would sell for like 10 X I'd assume. I'll have to bump that idea over to my to to, to Luke, who does Luke, the Luke loves Pokemon uh, podcast, because he would know what he would know which ones to get as well. Where I don't know anything about Pokemon. Um, have I ever told you my one Pokemon gaming experience? Your one Pokemon gaming experience? Yeah, I mean proper game. I've played some of the dumb casual ones a little bit too, but uh, it, it was Heart Gold on the DS. I started playing. I got to was it Central City, Capital City. Went into the uh, casino and never came out. And then a year later, it's like, oh, I don't remember how to play the actual game anymore. So, <laughs> uh, Luke, the guy I mentioned, currently has my DS collection. And he was like, I'm going to find your file and stream that. And, you know, stream <laughs> this thing from 10 years ago. Oh, and my Pokemon Go experience. That was fun. I downloaded it on American Apple Store. Weirdly, it actually came out in America a few months before Japan, which kind of leads credence to the, the mapping theory but um anyway it came out later in japan but i started playing it when it came out in america so i was playing um existentialist pokemon where i was like day one day two day three it's just i'm standing in a field of you know absolutely nothing because they hadn't started the game in japan yet <laughs> that was good for some facebook posts but not really good uh, from a gaming perspective <laughs> yeah i i uh so i got the first pokemon game boy game when it came out I didn't want to go onto this tangent, but it was like my friend got fired from Walmart, his first job ever, because he helped. Uh, he basically told all of his friends, he was like, come on in, I'll get you a free Game Boy. So like me and like five of our friends, we just show up. We all get free Game Boys with the Pokemon like baked into the Game Boy color package. And the, the idiot didn't realize that there was like a camera pointed right at him. It was like his first week. So of course they're like watching him and scrutinizing him <laughs> and they just see him on like his first week, just giving all these free game boys away. But yeah, so my, my first Pokemon game was ill gotten. So I have like a special affinity to that. But I also remember when Pokemon go came out and uh, I, I was, I mean, I still live in Orlando, but I was like right in downtown Orlando uh, clo like on international, closer to like where the parks were at, at least Universal Studios and stuff. And I had one of those, um, I had like a jailbroke iPad, I think, that I had from my work that I was using for something. And it had all like the developer options enabled and stuff. And we figured out a way to like spoof the GPS, which people figured out way after that too. Um, but like I was, I was killing it, man. I was like one of the, the top Pokemon Go accounts 
uh, in the state of Florida just because I would spoof GPS into the Walt Disney World and just massacre anyone that tried to take over the little trainers, like the, the <laughs> training gyms and stuff. Um, but that was a lesson in digital honeypots because I think that they intentionally left it open and let people spoof GPS for like three months or something. And then they released a patch and the patch basically looked for anyone that had sent any payloads to their system in the last three months that didn't include some like special key that had been encrypted away. So it was like they were just letting people cheat for three months and then drop the ban hammer and wipe them all out. It was very efficient, very efficient. But it well, was that's a great way so to keep fun. you not not getting you addicted to the game, right? You have fun for three months. I, I got a dumb casual game on my iPad, and and right now I'm getting to the point. You know what? This is now getting too difficult. So time to erase. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, and, and this might sound bad, but it wasn't. It was never fun about playing the game. I don't care about Pokemon. I don't have any affinity to the series. I didn't even think that the gameplay itself was even good. It was actually kind of very rudimentary. You just like flick the ball and hope for the best. It was it was almost like gambling in a way, but you didn't win anything. But there was something about knowing there was a real person out there that was like trying to take over this gym and they spent all their time. Like, you know, like I'd come back and like all this time had gone by and you see all these people had taken over. And you just jump in there and take it on back. Like, I don't know. There was there's something fun about knowing there was probably somebody very disappointed that they just lost their gym and they're gonna have to go back onto Disney property if they weren't also cheating and spoofing <laughs> in order to reclaim it. Uh, uh, I, I guess more productive, or I don't know if it's more productive or not. My my old programmer roommate, you know, he he'd make he'd do the Stanley Kubrick chess game thing by with EverQuest, right? Where he just like try and build up characters really quick and then sell them. And he'd make, mm. I think he paid rent on that once or twice. <laughs> Cause he, he was pretty good at the game, but he was doing it you know, as work. And then like, okay, here's a good character. Someone will buy this <laughs> for good money. I mean, I people still do that. I think they've, they've clamped down on it. They make it against terms of service. And if they catch you doing that, then you know, you're out an account and uh, whatever money you paid for it and stuff. But yeah, I remember that. Uh, and I was in the military when the first EverQuest came out and it was like an unspoken thing that people were using the top secret, you know, government networks to basically play EverQuest in some of the back IT closets. <laughs> so is EverQuest still a thing? I, I, I was never in MMO, whatever those initials are in the first place. I think that they, they've they come out with new ones recently, yeah. Okay, because World of Warcraft is still kicking, I believe. I don't know. Again, haven't I've never been that kind of a gamer. Of that. I've, I've, I've tried it a couple times. I just never got into it. Yeah, I, I've gotten to the point where, because in the past, I've just played insane numbers of 90 style JRPGs. But man, I don't have time for that. Partly because I do podcasts, which is kind of useful. Um, uh, by the way, I have realized my cold medicine has kicked in. I'm just going to ramble for infinity. So uh, if, if you do have some notes or something, I, I can... Uh, give you the, the floor for that or just keep rambling. No, I mean, I think we, we covered all my notes pretty uh, sequentially as we went through this. I think that the overall it's a serviceable movie. I didn't grow up really in love with the recess TV series. Uh, so I just watched the movie as it was. I thought it was cool that it was had the conspiratorial theme. It starts right off the bat. The military's in on it or at least like a paramilitary style group. I was kind um, of expecting a Nora to run, you know, into oh. Area 51. <laughs> <laughs> but and yeah, yeah it, I, it just reminded me of how much I hated school again. I'm <laughs> I'm just deeply scarred from my school experience. I here's the thing. I do think if I had ended up being a public school teacher in America, I would have 100 percent hated it. My job right now is private. I teach English. I mean, I'm pretty much work by myself most of the time. I don't really, I mean, you know, I know how to teach when I'm teaching, but it's not like there's like curriculum I have to hit, you know, there's not like test scores I have to hit anything like that. I just kind of bop in, you know, hopefully I learn some English. I bop out of the room. So I have it much better than the average American teacher. Um, oh, I, I don't think anyone would be uh, doubting that. I don't think anyone. I was about to say, I, I probably get paid less than, than them though. And then I was like, Oh, actually I probably don't get paid. Well, okay. With current exchange rates, I get paid less than them, but um, <laughs> depending on the state, man, honestly, maybe depending on the state. No, no. Two years ago. Uh, it, it seems like Japan's currency really did start to take a nosedive with the Ukraine war. Um, 
So before that, I probably was like on any level making more than, you know, uh, teachers in half the states. But so you're going to uh, be eating bugs with the rest of us. I am going to be eating bugs with the rest of you. So <laughs> as our as our money makes less and less sense. Uh, you, you blasted out. You're never a straight answer comic, though. But uh, I, I guess if we're closing it down, you got you got another thing on the burner you want to. That's the, the big one. I mean, I've got so many different projects that are always going, but I've I've learned to just laser focus on the one that's actually active at the given moment. So, yeah, if you like Stanley Kubrick, if you like uh, cartoons or comics, if you if you're listening to this, and you've gotten to the end of this one. You obviously like us enough that you would love Never a Straight Answer, which is a comic I've been working on for about five years now. Uh, I mean, it was originally a project that I just kind of started to fill in some time. And then uh, it turned into like the thing that I wanted to do more than anything else. I ended up putting a bunch of other projects on the shelf to knock this one out just because it, it felt like the perfect format to get every inside Stanley Kubrick reference. I can uh, sort of sneak into this one. So every Stanley Kubrick movie, every conspiracy theory you've ever heard about him and some that you even haven't, uh, it's all kind of in this one little series. It's the ultimate love letter to both Stanley Kubrick and to all the fake moon landing conspiracy theories. And yeah, uh, at nasacomic.com, you can find where that's at. All righty. As for me, uh, I do a lot of podcasting. Uh, that's at pod. Uh, at Central Point is on Patreon at Podcastio Podcastius. Talk about the Twilight Zone, Space 1999, and movies where we've recently done a few Kubricks. We did 2001 at the beginning of the year. Uh, we just put out Paths of Glory and uh, Doctor Strange Love is is soon. So if I, I'm ranting with some folks about those over there. Okay. Paths of Glory sometimes has an asterisk next to it because I believe that's one that he got called on to to like take over production at some point. Yeah, that in Spartacus, he's definitely more yeah. of a hired hand. A Spartacus is the one he's definitely a hired. That's the one where he was added on like basically two weeks before shooting. So uh, Pazaglor, I think he did have a little more skin in the game for that one, but it, it, it was still a Kirk Douglas vehicle when it when it was being produced. So I, I guess it was Kirk Douglas number one, Stanley Kubrick number two for that one. Um, you know, Spartacus probably put Kubrick under the producers because uh, he just jumped in late. Uh, Lolita, don't bother. You can not watch Lolita if you feel like it. And and then Doctor Strange of yeah, that's where it's just like now everything's Kubrick. <laughs> this is kind of the way I see it. Paths of Glory is a very good movie. I, I do recommend it. Um, we we actually had a discussion. We we're like, is it better? Is it a better war movie than Full Metal Jacket? And we're like, if you're only counting the first forty five minutes of Full Metal Jacket, Full Metal Jacket's better. But if you're counting the complete movies, the whole movies, eh, Paths of Glory is probably better. <laughs> And man, I would almost, and it, we, I mean, probably don't have enough time to make the argument fully. Um, but that Full Metal Jacket isn't really a war movie, even though there's a lot of war scenes. It feels like it has less to do with war than Past Past the Glory does. Oh, the first forty five minutes of the movie, the war, any war stuff is just window dressing. It's all about you know psychological terror and programming and stuff, right? That's not a war. That's not necessarily a war movie. I think that's. Because the rest of the movie is still good. It's just now it is a kind of a war movie, but it just loses so much juice. And you just got rid of, you know, the two best actors in the thing. So, oops. <laughs> anyway, that's that's my review of Full Metal Jacket, which we'll, we are not doing on Films and Filth because um, it's not on the list. <laughs> and we're not doing it in a cult Disney because it's not a Disney movie, unfortunately. It would make zero sense to do Full Metal Jacket for the Occult Disney <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I don't know if we're doing an April Fools, although there's probably something wittier to do for that. All right. Ready for a cosmic conspiracy about Stanley Kubrick, moon landings, and the CIA? Go visit nasacomic.com. Nasacomic.com. CIA's biggest con. Stanley Kubrick put us on this while we're singing this song. I'm nasacomic.com. Go visit nasacomic.com. Go visit nasacomic.com. Yeah, go visit nasacomic.com. Oh, nasacomic.com.
Capcom, CIA's biggest con. Stanley Kubrick put us on. That's why we're singing this song. Bob Nessa Comic. Never a straight answer is a 40-page comic about Stanley Kubrick directing the Apollo space missions. This is the perfect read for comic Kubrick or conspiracy fans of all ages. For more details, visit nasacomic.com. Scribble my life away, driven to write the page. Will it enlighten your brain? Give you the flight, my plane, paper the highs ablaze. Somewhat of an amazing feel when it's real, the real you will engage it. Your favorite, of course, the Lord of an arrangement. I gave you the proper results to hit the pavement. If they get emotional, hey, maybe your language, a game, how they playing it well without Lakers evade them. Whatever the cost, they are the shape shift. Snakes get decapitated, met is the apex. Execution of flame, you out. Nuclear bomb, distributed at war Rather gruesome for eyes to see Max them out, then I light my trees Blow it off in the face, you're despising me For what though? Calculated and rather cutthroat Paranoid American, must be all the blood smoke For real, Lord, give me a day away Vacate, they wait around to hate Whatever they say Matters not in the least bit We get heavy rotate when a beat hits So thank us, you're welcome Fuck the niggas for real, you're welcome They ain't never had a deal you welcome, man, they lacking appeal. You welcome, yet they doing it still. You welcome.